tracking the amazing growth of the first century church to challenge and inspire the 21st century church. This is Unstoppable Church, Then and Now, recorded on location in Israel, Cyprus, Turkey, Greece, Malta and Italy. Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont is in conversation for the next 30 minutes with David Taverner. We discovered last time, Mike, that the book of Acts ends somewhat abruptly. But, I mean, was that the end of the story for Paul? Did he sort of go into a quiet retirement? <laughs> Can you imagine Paul going into any sort of retirement? Um, no, it wasn't. Though Acts doesn't tell us any more about it. It just ends with Paul spending two whole years there under house arrest. But the very fact that Acts ends on a sort of open-ended nature I, I think tells us two things one is Luke wanted to communicate you couldn't stop this gospel from spreading and two it sounds like there was still more to come in the story that Luke for some reason doesn't record whether he wasn't around and with Paul whether he was dead by then we simply don't know but there's evidence in the rest of the New Testament that after Paul had finished his two years of house arrest, he went on to defer the missionary work before coming back to Rome again, which is where he would eventually end up in jail proper and lose his life for his faith. I notice you said that it was two whole years that he was in house arrest. Yeah, an interesting little detail, and we might think why, did Luke add that two whole years? Well, it was because in those days, if you were brought to trial and the evidence was not brought against you within two years, the case lapsed. That was Roman law. So Luke notes that, the two whole years, to show that the case lapsed. Why? Quite simply because the evidence had not come from Judea that had led to him being here in the first place. So as a Roman citizen under Roman law, he would have every right to be released and to carry on with his life. So he's off again. But I always thought there were just three missionary journeys of Paul. <laughs> yeah, there are in the book of Acts. But scholars have worked out there was almost certainly a fourth journey because they can put bits of data together from Paul's later letters where he mentions visits to places that aren't recorded elsewhere in Acts. And they're a little bit like pieces of a jigsaw. We don't have the whole picture. But they do certainly seem to point in one direction. So scholars think that he was released by Nero eventually in AD 62, uh, probably because his opponents hadn't turned up, as we'd said. And then went on to do further work. Now, why do we think that and where did he go? Well, here's some of the places that he mentioned. I can't say that these were in order or this is the way that it actually happened, but he undoubtedly visited these places, it seems, over this period after he was released. So we get him mentioning Crete, and commissioning Titus to lead the church there in Titus 1.5. So he's not just writing to him, he's actually there commissioning Titus to lead that church. He mentions Miletus. Do you remember the harbour near to Ephesus? He ends up back there where he says he left Trophimus sick in 2 Timothy 4.20. If he's going to Miletus, he's obviously going to Ephesus, And again, that gets mentioned because in 1 Timothy 1.3, he mentions how he left Timothy in charge of the church there. He almost certainly went to Colossae because in that little letter Philemon, verse 22, he says there, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. He visited Troas where in 2 Timothy 4.13 we discover he left his cloak with someone called Carpus. He visited Philippi, we discover in 1 Timothy 1.3, where he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. He went to Corinth, 
noted in 2 Timothy 4, 20, he says, Erastus, I left at Corinth, and that doesn't fit any of the other journeys. He visited Nicopolis in Western Achaia, Titus 3, 12. He says, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis. So all those places we have Paul mentioning that he was there. We don't know in what order and under what time scale, how long that period was. And some scholars think he may even have made it to Spain because that was his sort of long-term ambition. And he mentions that at the end of Romans, Romans 15, 24. And this was Paul's passion. He had sort of two passions in life. One was to get to Rome. Why? Because all roads led to Rome. And if he could get here to Rome, to the center of power, he could preach to those with power. And of course, as people became Christians, they could go out across the whole Roman Empire, across this amazing network of roads. Our guide this morning told us that in those days, there were 60,000 miles of roads went out from this place. I mean, that is absolutely incredible. So his first passion was get here at Rome. Well, he's done that, but he's also had this burning passion that keeps coming out in the letters to get to Spain. Was that, as far as he was concerned, to the ends of the earth? Oh, absolutely. Remember, a verse that we've quoted again and again throughout this series, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth in ever-increasing circles like a pebble dropped in water with the ripples going out. So Paul really had this passion to get to the ends of the earth. And in those days, of course, Spain was the ends of the earth, the the outermost part of the Roman Empire, certainly in the West. So he has this burning passion to get there. Now, did he get there? We simply don't know. We have evidence of all those other places that I listed. Spain, question mark. But the places he went to were places he'd been to before, so he wasn't reaching out into new areas. This was to go back yet again and, what, encourage those that were there. Yeah, and we see glimpses of that in Acts, don't we, where he goes back, retraces his steps. To do what? To encourage them, to make sure they're going on well in the faith, to establish them well through teaching, to appoint elders for them. He says that his practice was to appoint elders in every place that he went to. So Paul was not a sort of church planter who just, you know, wanted figures and said, that's another one planted on to the next place. He passionately cared about these communities of Christians that he planted and so loved going back to them to make sure that they were well established. Do we know how long he was away from Rome and indeed why he came back here? I mean, he's been under house arrest for two years. Why on earth come back? Yeah, the truth is we don't exactly know how long it was. He was released from his house arrest in sort of late 62, early 63 AD. And we know that he was imprisoned under Nero in the the second Neronian persecution, the second big wave uh, of Nero's madness against the Christians. And that was 66, 67 AD. So you've, you could have a gap there of up to four years that he traveled. It could have been less than that. He could have spent time here, of course. But that's the maximum period that we've got, the maximum window we've got for him doing this stuff. So previously he was here in Rome under house arrest, but this next time he was actually in prison. Oh, absolutely. Um, because next time he, he swept up in the purge against Christians. Now... I think in a sense that tells us a lot about the man because if he knew he was doing all these travels and he was being very successful in all those places where he was visiting and revisiting and you knew there was a purge going on here in Rome, then, you know, the, quote, sensible thing to do would be to keep away from Rome, wouldn't it? And to continue with your ministry there because it was being very effective but Paul believed in setting an example for the believers. And I think, I think he came back here to show that he wasn't afraid, 
that he was prepared to come back and stand by the Christians here who were experiencing so much opposition and persecution, even to the point of, you know, yielding his life himself. So, frankly, tremendously, well, it, it was either courageous or mad, but um, I, I think, you know, we probably know which one it was. This was the spirit of Jesus in him. And uh, for him, to live was Christ, to die was gain. So where are we now then in relation to that part of the story? We are sitting outside a a wonderful little church that's actually being restored at the moment because the roof collapsed some time ago. It's St. Joseph of the Carpenters Church, which was built over the prison in Rome and is right next to the Forum, the political heart of Rome. So its very nature shows you what this was for. Now, this was the site of the only prison in Rome in those days. It was called the Casa, was its Roman name. The only prison? Yeah. There was only one, because you didn't have prisons like we do these days, which are a mixture of, you know, partly punishment, but also hopefully partly reformative, trying to rehabilitate people. There was no understanding of rehabilitation in those days. So for the vast majority of people who committed crimes, Rome's answer was to put them to work. So many of them at this period would be used shortly to build, for example, that great Colosseum. So they were seen as free workmen. So who was put in prison? The only people who were put in prison at this time were political prisoners. Hence the site of this church and the prison beneath it, right next to the forum, the political centre. This is where the political prisoners came. That is, those who were seen as a threat to the power of Rome. And of course, Christians were seen as a threat to the power of Rome at this period. Why? Because they declared that Jesus was Lord, not Caesar was Lord. And this church is built right over the only prison from those days, the carcer of that time. So where you and I have just been right now, we have really been walking in the footsteps of Paul. We know that this is where he was brought. We've just walked down, haven't we, an amazing cobbled street, but not with the tiny cobbles we know, with cobbles a, a foot across each way. And to think that that was there when Paul was here and that was the road down to this castle, and he walked down that step and was taken down, down into the earth, just as we have been into that smelly, damp prison cell down below. How were prisoners kept in that prison? Well, there were sort of two main parts to it. There's an upper chamber. Uh, It's all carved deep into the stone, so we're below ground for all of it. And in that upper chamber, that's where the condemned prisoners were brought, first of all. And they're right in the centre of this upper chamber carved into the stone. There's a hole. It's got a grill over it these days to stop us falling down. But there's a chamber down below that. Now, thankfully, we can access that by a narrow circular stairway that's been added these days. But in those days, you were let down into that lower chamber down below with sort of ropes. Ropes would be put under your arm and you were simply lowered down into that uh, lower chamber. And, I mean, as we stood there, I mean, you could smell the dampness and you could see the dampness penetrating the walls, couldn't you? Because it's like a cave, really. Absolutely. And, I mean, we had lights down there. But, of course, there would probably been, you know, no light or very little light for the prisoners down there. And the whole idea of it was, um, it was to make people despair. And I think you go down there and that's the sort of feeling that you get, isn't it? And, uh, you know, I just stood there a few minutes ago and, and was just thinking, reflecting, praying, looking and thinking. This Paul whose story we followed, his, his life was going to end here or very close to here. And it, it, it was a very dispiriting place. And yet, despite the fact that it is a dispiriting place, dark, damp, smelly, Paul remains undefeated throughout it all. And and that's why we've called this episode Undefeated, because while he would be taken from there, 
to a place of execution nearby. And remember, executions were public executions. They were, they were a bit of entertainment for the crowds, and he would have been brought up from that lower chamber, ropes again put under his arms, and brought out here and taken to this forum or very close to this nearby, where, as a Roman citizen, he would have been beheaded. Not executed, Roman citizens were exempt from that. Uh, their method of execution was beheading. And in fact, inside uh, this church where we've been, down in its crypt, there's a couple of stone slabs there recording how some of the saints were uh, executed over the years. Many of them beheaded, uh, some of them, at least one there, starved to death. So a grim, grim place, really, for Paul to end his life. So when he was in that prison, that cave-like cell, if you like, he, he knew that was the end. Oh, absolutely. And how do we know that? Because it comes out in one of his letters. Now, we're going to read um, from 2 Timothy chapter four where we get a glimpse into what paul was thinking and feeling why because he wrote this while he was there isn't this guy amazing you know no sitting there feeling sorry for himself no sort of feeling poor me i've done all this for you lord and this is how it's ending up no i mean it, you know it clearly impacted the guy as we'll see but he refuses to give in he stays undefeated he's going to write from here uh, he, he's he's going to keep going for Jesus to the bitter end. And I think as we read this passage in a minute, we will see a mixture of the absolutely undefeated spirit, yet the very dark reality of the human situation. So let's read it. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. You see there how he's still thinking about others? Yeah, indeed. But then he goes on, to write this, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. 
and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. I noticed he doesn't talk about his death. He talks about his departure. What a wonderful, wonderful picture there. You see, he knows death is not the end. They might kill his body, but they can't kill him. He knows he is going to remain undefeated just as the church is. And actually, there's a beautiful word that is chosen there because the word that's chosen there for my departure is a nautical word. And it was the word that was used of a ship slipping its moorings. Isn't that fantastic? Here he is locked up Mm. in this dismal dungeon underground there, just meters from where we are. And yet he can describe death that he sees so clearly is coming, is so close now. And he says, it's just like a ship slipping moorings, really. They'll take off the ropes and the ship will slip out to sea. And as it goes to the horizon, they'll say from this side, she's gone. And instantly from the other side, they'll say, there she comes. What an amazing picture he uses there. Paul had no fear of death despite all that he was facing here. It was just like a ship slipping its moorings to go to the next place, to go to a better place. You you might think, you know, bearing in mind what he's experienced, but how determined he has been, that he had a death wish. Yeah, I don't think he had a death wish. Um, I mean, he had a life wish. He wanted to keep preaching as often as he could. Uh, Why did he come back here to Rome? You know, it might have looked like a death wish. No, he was determined to keep preaching Jesus. He was determined to encourage the Christians. So it's not that he has a death wish, but he has no fear of death. And the two are quite different. And Paul absolutely had no fear fear of death. Why? Because he knew what was on the other side. After all, he'd met in person the risen Lord Jesus. He knew that death was not the end. We saw that in that previous episode in Acts chapter 9, that wonderful encounter on the Damascus road that turned his life around. And, you know, we may not have that sort of physical, personal encounter with Jesus that he did, but we can still have encounters with Jesus spiritually today that lead us to be so convinced that death is not the end, that Christ died for our sins, rose again, and that all who trust in him can have hope for the future, unshakable, confident hope, just like Paul did. Certainly the language in those words to Timothy were not in any way defeatist. Not at all. And he says here, I fought the good fight. (laughs) I finished the race. I've kept the faith, using different imagery there, isn't it? But saying, I've I've got there. I've completed it. I've done what God gave me to do. I mean, how wonderful to get to the end of a life and say, I can honestly say I feel I've done what God gave me to do. There's nothing left. There's nothing lacking. And then he says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. The crown, remember that laurel wreath that was given to winners in the races here in the games and he sees that crown awaiting him in heaven and not just him he says but to all who've longed for his appearing he also references the fact that though others had disappointed him Mm. jesus hadn't oh isn't that wonderful yeah it's interesting isn't it others had left him and it seems they'd left him for different reasons. He referred there to Demas, who loved this world and deserted me. He loved this life more than anything else. And so when the threat came against the Christians, Demas was one of those who said, do you know what? (laughs) I'll take a rain check on this. Thank you. And uh, I love this life too much to make my stand at this point. And he deserted Paul and went to Thessalonica. Now, the others hadn't deserted him, but they'd moved on. Why? Because of unstoppable church. You know, the message still needs to continue, and I'm sure that that Paul added his blessing 
to them going. So Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Ah, now that's interesting. So Luke still is around mm. at this point, but for some reason doesn't add this bit into the story at the book of Acts. And Tychicus I've sent to Ephesus. So these are people who have left him, either willfully or because Paul had wanted them to do so, so willfully or strategically. And as you said, what a wonderful contrast where he says, at my first defense, no one came to my support. Can you imagine that? Not a single person willing to come and speak up for you. After all that. And then he still says, may it not be held against them. Wow. But what a contrast. The Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. Wow. You know, to any listeners today who are in really difficult situations, maybe you feel everyone's abandoned you, everyone's turned against you, there's no one there. Well, I want to tell you this, you can reach out to Jesus and you, like Paul, can say, and no, but the Lord stood at my side. He's with you, he's with you today, he's with you in your situation. And there were a few sort of personal belongings that he needed, even at that late stage fascinating and there's just a little human touch here as well as a spiritual touch because he asks for two things doesn't he bring the cloak that i left with carpus at trice bring the cloak why well you and i have just been down into that cell and it's cold and today is a very very hot day as it often is in rome Mm. it's in the low 30s and it's still early morning but down there in those dungeons it is cold it is damp and there's this human touch this great apostle wants his cloak to keep warm could you bring my cloak please it's the only thing i need humanly oh and then he had something else and my scrolls especially the parchments scrolls of course were made of papyrus parchments made of animal skins what are these Well, they're either copies of his scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, or they are some of these early Christian writings that he wants to add to, he wants to complete. So these two things, he'd love a cloak to keep him warm, but I tell you what, I'd love my scrolls and my parchments, because at the end of the day, it's not about what happens to my body, it's it's what about happens to my spirit and my soul. And here's, again, a little glimpse into the undefeated Paul. He's going to stick at this to the very end. And and yet he's being very human in doing so. He's cold. He wants a cloak. He feels a bit let down by some of his friends. Yet he refuses to give in. Why? Because the Lord Jesus stood at my side. And when we know that Jesus is at our side, then we too can be undefeated today. He's got no idea exactly when he'll be executed, but what would it be, days, weeks? Yeah, we're simply not sure. It was normally fairly quick once you were put there. Remember, prison didn't have the same sense that it does today. It was a holding place for execution. So uh, probably just a few weeks, I think, at the most. But we can't be sure, let me stress that. But um, tradition says that he was executed in about AD 67 in this second Neronian persecution by the sword. His head would have been cut off, uh, as was his right as a Roman citizen. But what a legacy. Oh, an incredible legacy. And I'm actually holding some of it here, right in front of me as I'm speaking to you. I'm holding a Bible. And in that Bible is the New Testament. And much of that New Testament are either the writings by this guy or writings about that guy. I mean, what an incredible legacy to leave behind. So, I mean, he really was undefeated. Yeah, they killed him close to where we are now. But they didn't win. I mean, where is the Roman Empire today? Where are the memories of Nero other than that everybody remembers he was mad? All those things passed. But this man, whose life they took close to where we are now, remained undefeated. 
and we hold his works in our hands today, life-giving scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit to not only tell us the history, but to inspire us and guide us for our life today. So he was absolutely an undefeated man. And whoever trusts in the same Jesus that he trusted in can be undefeated today, no matter what happens to you, no matter what people might do to you. And of course, the church remains an undefeated church. Here in Rome, at this power base by the forum, they tried to extinguish the church. Well, let me ask you, which one is it that survives today? Mike Beaumont and David Taverner, traveling from Jerusalem to Rome and beyond to track the amazing growth of the first century church and what that means for the unstoppable church of the 21st century. There are more Bible podcasts from Mike and David on the UCB Player app and major podcast platforms. Check out Jesus Then and Now or Bible Books in 30 Minutes.